Hello and welcome back to this downfully idealistic crusade. This video is about the recent news of the passing of Norman Jewison, who I think is one of the most unrecognized and underrated of the great directors of, of his era, and somebody who I always respected and admired, somebody who was very much dedicated to his craft, and also not just the film industry, but the film industry in his native Canada, uh, which is something that I don't think most people realize. Not only was he Canadian, but also uh, he strove continuously, even after his retirements, to help bolster and build up the Canadian film industry in both the industry itself and the younger people trying to get into uh, the film industry in Canada and trying to uh, at least create some support for, for the film industry there, which really needed all the support it could get. But uh, Jewison was never a director who was super flashy, and I think that's partly why he's not as well known and as much discussed. Uh, some of his films are incredibly iconic and uh, uh, timeless classics or, or beloved as as classic genre films or beloved for certain performances. But I think a lot of people overlook the fact that there's a unifying theme. There's one person running through all of these. And uh, Norman Jewison had one of the just most enormous ranges of any director because he could seemingly move from any genre. He was not bound by that. And in that sense, he had the abilities of a classical studio era director, such as Michael Curtiz being being able to jump to any genre, it, it seemed, and that not be an issue ever. Uh, he had a particular style that was very, very quiet and very focused on storytelling. So the actual filmmaking craft is is more of the invisible style, which again means that I think that's partly why he's never been, uh, you know, trumpeted as much as as other directors who have a very vivid, obvious style that is very much apparent from from the uh, first frames. Well, Jewison has that, but it's something that you're only going to pick up on if you're looking at his film films together or at his body of work, or if you're a dedicated cinephile who is dedicated to picking up on sort of career trajectories or career themes. And I think all of this and the, the, the fact that his most famous films usually are looked at for the importance of their story and the uh, the, the themes and the performances that it, it kind of overshadows the fact that there was a real creative force behind all of them. And he was also extremely unassuming and very much one of, I think, the most admirable of, of all directors who was also a genuinely great person in real life, which is not always something you, you, you get that it doesn't always go hand in hand with great artistry. So I, I think looking at uh, Norman Jewison's body of work as, as a director is just a, it's a fascinating body of work. And it is constantly peppered with, uh, of course, great performances because he was a brilliant actor's director. He was able to get performances out of, out of uh, actors and actresses that uh, really became either iconic for them or, or are just incredible powerhouse performances that are so directly tied to the themes of the story that you can't think of the film without those performances. And some of these performances are among the, the best in uh, said actor or actress's career. Uh, but also, Jewison had a real sense of uh, social commentary. He was continually drawn to stories about the human condition, about problems we have that still exist in our society. In the Heat of the Night is probably the most obvious, and that was a very personal film for him to make because he wound up traveling through the American South as, as a young man and witnessed the inherent racism firsthand, uh, which, which was something he had no real concept of, being a young Canadian who had just gotten out of the service in World War II and was just sort of traveling through the American South. And this just basically hit him like a brick wall, and he never forgot it. And it's very obvious in the films that he made that deal openly with racism. In the Heat of the Night is the most famous and the most iconic because of the time at which it was made. But the, the real reason, I think, for its extreme effectiveness and its sense of realism is that this is a, a person who had actually seen and witnessed these these things firsthand and uh, knew that he had to say something about them, but also present them as 
as they really were so deeply entrenched in a particular society and culture that people didn't even really think about it and and think about what they were doing and what they were promoting. And that's partly why that film is so striking and effective to this very day, because, it, again, it, it definitely helps when it's being directed by somebody who has seen and witnessed this stuff firsthand, and it's so vividly marked them and and stuck with them and was burned into their very brain that it it helped stir the fires of 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 that of that conviction to say something of importance about societal issues and this is really a, a this is really the key theme that I think runs through all of, of Jewison's work. Even the, the films that are obviously more commercial or uh, were bigger financial successes, there is something about the human condition in all of his work. And I think that's the, the, the key theme that runs through everything, whether it's In the Heat of the Night or even Moonstruck or Rollerball or And Justice for All. Uh, it, it, and to even look at his filmography, it is a staggering amount of titles. Some are iconic, some are little seen today, but all of them maintain a consistency of quality. And he could even turn around and do stage play adaptations and musicals. He, of course, directed Fiddler on the Roof, and also wound up directing the film version of Jesus Christ Superstar. And I think the reason why both of those films have a quality to them is because of the person who made them. And you can see with those films how uh, how they could have gone if they had been made by somebody else. And uh, I mean, I think one of the greatest examples of uh, a director's range is uh, looking at Norman Jewison uh, really becoming a big, bigger name and better known director in the 1960s. He had worked uh, extensively and really gotten his training in uh, the Canadian television, really, throughout the 1950s, and also dabbling in Canadian radio. But he essentially was able to eventually make the jump into features and directed a number of features, but wasn't really somebody who was a name until he wound up being the person who was selected to take over the Cincinnati Kid after the sort of unfortunate kerfuffle that caused the producers of that film to fire Sam Peckinpah and Norman Jewison was the person who had to come in and basically reshoot the film that had been shot and try to patch everything together and actually finish the film which is not a good situation for anybody to be in and I think it's really because he was the person selected that that that's the only reason why that film was even finished and became a, a classic and iconic work of its own, even though it, it definitely has ties to uh, themes already seen and displayed in The Hustler. And of course, this started a sort of partnership and relationship dynamic between uh, Jewison and Steve McQueen, which would result in what is perhaps McQueen's most iconic performance in The Thomas Crown Affair in 1968. So uh, Jewison definitely established relationships with various actors and actresses that he would work with multiple times and uh, these sort of rapports that that he would develop with with performers in particular I think is why he should be recognized as a fantastic actors director because he has gotten some of the best performances of, of a star's entire career in, in in films even if they weren't giant box office successes you can look at at some of the performances he would get out of people and they're they're just incredible but in terms of a director having range, you go from the Cincinnati Kid to what I think is Jewison's masterpiece, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, which is one of the most underrated films ever made and is one of the greatest societal commentaries. Uh, it's, it's a social satire first and foremost. It has gut-bursting comedy, but it also has genuine heart and warmth and actually tells a story about the human condition. It's one of the greatest films made about the Cold War during the Cold War. It has tinges of satire on the levels of Dr. Strangelove, but is also a comedy that is also about the shared human condition that exists even between Americans and, at the time, Soviets, and a an incredible contrived scenario that sets off the film. It works on so many incredible levels, but to then go from that film to In the Heat of the Night is just, it's a, it's a complete 180, and that, I think, is just one of the best examples you, you can have of what range really means for a director in terms of 
being able to just go completely to the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of tone and themes and genre and location and uh, the the actual way you're having to direct actors and how you're having to stage the individual scenes because if you look at at those two films back to back you know you wouldn't necessarily think it was the same director but when you know it's the same director and you can see the the commitment to getting every single element of what the original story is trying to convey and to get something across about the human condition and to have important points made about our society and the inherent negative aspects of our society but yet never lose sight of the fact that you know we're we're all technically the same we we all come from the same place there is a shared human condition uh, so I, I think again, it goes back to to this this notion of when when somebody has a commitment and a real work ethic, but isn't necessarily trying to have flashy directorial flourishes. If they're so focused on the work that their craftsmanship almost becomes invisible, which is what a director is really supposed to do, it means that I, I think unfairly they, they will get overlooked. And there are so many great unheralded films that Jewison directed and so many great performances. Even some some of his uh, his lesser films that I, that you know might not have perfect scripts or might have elements that didn't quite work as well they always remain so incredibly well crafted that you can certainly tell that somebody was there behind the camera really driving the film along who really cared about the material and wasn't going to ever half-ass something and i think that's just about the most admirable quality that you can find in any director and for years i have felt that jewison has been criminally underrated i still feel this way and i i, I sort of hated the fact that he he retired in about 2003 or so after his last film and i i had just wished that he had been able to to uh maybe do another film or two but of course you know totally understand people wanting to retire. He also uh, kept working tirelessly to promote the Canadian film industry and also wrote an incredible memoir, which is entitled This Terrible Business Has Been Very Good to Me, which I read uh, when I discovered it in, in a library. And gosh, that's one of the best uh, film industry memoirs that I think you can possibly read. It's a brilliant book that very much gives you 100% of somebody's work ethic and a sense of what they were like. It's one of the best film industry books you can read. I personally would have it, you know, on the level of Sidney Lumet's Making Movies. And I think Jewison is very much of that same sort of class as Sidney Lumet as being somebody who put all of themselves into their work and telling stories and raising important points about about our society and getting incredible performances out of people, but never necessarily getting that big name recognition. So I think uh, Lumet is just about the most underrated of all American directors, and uh, Jewison is definitely in there in that list. So of course, but of course, being Canadian, I think he's probably the most underrated Canadian film director. But uh, just looking at his body of work, I mean, there are many iconic titles many truly underrated films and this is just a, a small selection of of some of the the uh jewish titles i have on physical media i couldn't even fit all of them behind me uh my my first uh experience with his work was the thomas crown affair which is one of the most strikingly made films of the 1960s and studying that film is a crash course in a director scrambling because he knew and everybody knew that the film was all about atmosphere because the story was quite basic and when you look at the Thomas Crown Affair and the reason why the remake doesn't work is that the original film commits to the premise and Jewison has to build on the two lead performances and the atmosphere and the dynamic and what he does with technique, with staging, with blocking, uh, usage of split screen photography and using optical effects and things, how he layers in the score and what he does with just silent close-ups between Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway. I mean, that that film is entirely made in the direction of it because the story is so simple that when you stop and think about it, 
you know, the, the actual story content is maybe 10% of the effectiveness of that film. And Jewison freely admitted this. And if you look at all the extras and, and other information you can find about the film or Jewison talking about it, he freely admits this and how hard he had to work to actually make the film work. And that's why the film is iconic. And he manages to make Steve McQueen on screen even more mythic. And McQueen is one of the iconic faces who didn't even have to utter a line of dialogue and just a close-up could speak volumes. And never is that more apparent than in the Thomas Crown Affair, where he has little to no dialogue. And it's just incredibly impactful. But Jewison also knew exactly how that film had to end. They did not sugarcoat anything in that film. It still has, at its core, a sense of realism and about the real world. And the ending of that film is the crucial, critical moment. And that is what the remake doesn't understand and why the remake is and will always be inferior to the original version. Yes, I like elements of the remake, but if you look at both versions of the Thomas Crown Affair back-to-back, -back, the remake does not have any of the impact of the original film because the original film was masterminded essentially by somebody who knew he had to make it work and put all of his energy and effort into doing that because everybody knew the script wasn't really up to snuff. And it's that intensity and that creativity and that commitment that really creates the atmosphere that is the entire impact of the film. And it's most apparent in the film's ending, which is a bit of a downer, and how that story absolutely has to end for those characters, which, again, the remake totally misses. And that film coming after the great success of In the Heat of the Night shows that Jewison was not somebody to rest on his laurels and also was somebody who knew when something didn't work that he had to really put in extra effort and time to try and make it work. And that's something, unfortunately, that a lot of people also don't have. And again, talking about being able to just switch genres without any sort of hesitations or any limitations whatsoever. Uh, after Thomas Crown Affair, he winds up directing Fiddler on the Roof and then Jesus Christ Superstar. And then what does he do after that? But he goes into science fiction dystopia territory with the classic Rollerball. And it's Jewish and really focusing on the inherent themes of the sort of futuristic world, but also that's really, you know, talking about our society today and themes and issues that we had in 1975 that still exist. It's the intelligence behind this film. That's what makes it work. That's what makes it effective. And that's what makes it one of the best science fiction films of the 1970s. It's it's a film that's not often promoted on those strengths, but that's what makes it special and unique. And this is after he, right after he made Jesus Christ Superstar. So again, talking about directorial range, I mean, it's just unbelievable how easily he could just go from one genre to another. But again, he wasn't being limited by genre. He was merely telling great, impactful, meaningful stories as best as he possibly could. And he wasn't limiting himself in terms of sticking to a genre or being typed as a director. Another really striking film he made that uh, was very much uh, respected and got a lot of award nominations back when it came out, but unfortunately is not discussed enough today and I think was actually very much ahead of its time. Again, returning to themes seen in, in the heat of the night, uh, but you also have to look at A Soldier's Story, which is a fantastic film, again, very much ahead of its time, and this is the Indicator release. I think this is probably the best overall physical media release of one of Jewison's films, uh, and if you were to have any single one uh, of his films on a physical media release in terms of having fantastic supplements and really getting into the production of the film, I think the Indicator release of A Soldier's Story is the best physical media release of a Norman Jewison film, and this is one of his most underrated and best films and features one of Denzel Washington's best performances. And they would later pair again for The Hurricane, which is another of Denzel Washington's career best performances. So uh, again, even in the 2000s, Jewison was continuing to have uh, rapport with, with actors, but also uh, still working in themes of societal criticism and getting people to actually think about not only the world around them and themselves and their own viewpoints, but also about 
the human condition and to think outside of themselves. That 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 is the the key sort of theme that you find running through all of Jewison's films. And I also wanted to get a quick plug in for his last film, which is 2003's The Statement. This is a very little seen, little discussed film. It did get a you know decent sort of critical reception back when it came out, but it came and went very quickly. Uh, this was the last film he directed, and well, I think the the script is maybe a little iffy in a few spots. It is based on and inspired by real life events. But this is incredibly well directed and features one of Michael Caine's best performances, particularly uh, in in his later filmography. And there are moments of incredible nuance in performance in this film where you will literally see entire characterizations practically turn on a dime. It is so incredibly well directed and acted and performed that it it makes you once again realize what a real craftsman does in terms of, of directing. So uh, even though this film is very little seen, it is a, very much worth your time and shows that Jewison went out uh, in terms of his, his last film that he directed, uh, still getting incredible performances out of screen legends and, uh, you know, firing on all cylinders. So uh, basically, I just wanted to put something together in video form because uh, Jewison is one of, of the directors and, and really, honestly, one of the few people in, in the film industry that uh, especially in, in more modern years, that uh, the more I learned about them, the more of, of, of their films that I saw, and especially after reading his book a number of years ago, uh, it just finally dawned on me just, just how much the, of um, their, their ethos and, and just their work ethic and their, their commitment to storytelling and also uh, discussing the human condition and everything they ever did and, and also just being a genuinely good person. Uh, it's just... He, he became somebody I really admired and still do. And so uh, I, I, he's been, you know, one of the people I've always kind of championed in terms of directors who I think are unfairly overlooked or, or not as celebrated as they should be. And also, I think it would help if there were more and better physical media releases for a lot of his filmography, most of which does not have the uh, the level of quality in, in releasing that uh, that they deserve or, or, or any real supplements. So I certainly wish more of Jewison's films could see the level of care and quality treatment that Indicator uh, brought to A Soldier Story. Again, I think this is the best physical media release for one of Jewison's films, and it's a fantastic film that's very underrated in its own right. I certainly think that Norman Jewison was a brilliant director, a really great person, somebody who was committed to film as an art form and promoting film culture, but also uh, did incredible work for the Canadian film industry, which, you know, certainly needed that that assistance in terms of uh, bolstering itself and providing support for uh, newer generations of, of people who wanted to get into the film industry, but needed uh, more, more of a strong industry uh, foundation in, in Canada. So he didn't just make films and, and not do anything else. He was always active in other other elements that, you know, can be are, are, are more behind the scenes or more unseen or more in, in charity work or industry work that's very important, but it's not flashy. It's not going to be reported on much. It's not hyper visible. But the impact that he left is gigantic. And I, I do think he is one of the great directors that should be better known, but also one of the great directors who should be admired more. And and I think his whole career is an inspiration to, to all of us who want to make films, but want to actually care about what we do. And uh, I, I think his entire career is a great example of, of what it means to actually put yourself into your work and to 
always strive for for a certain level of quality and honesty in everything that you do. So I strongly recommend uh, if you have not seen any of his films or haven't seen more of his uh, more obscure titles, I, I would I strongly urge you to dig deeper into Norman Jewison's filmography. Please go and read his memoir. It is a fantastic read that is full of uh, brilliant information and uh, also analysis of his own work, but also fantastic remembrances of his history and his career, and I think is still one of the great memoirs about the film industry and about making art in general. It's one of the great film books. So uh, I just wanted to put something together because uh, it was just really sad news to to hear that he had passed away. But he did live to a ripe old age of about 97. So that's that's always nice. We uh, not not all of us managed to 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 get to a nice number like that. But uh, it, it, it just it really it, it really struck me because, uh, again, he's been somebody that the the more of his films and the more I learned about him over the years, I just I, he was one of the few people I truly admired in terms of modern cinema who was who was still around even though he had uh, retired back in 2003. So uh, I, I do think his filmography is severely criminally underappreciated, and I do think he was one of the absolute great actors directors post uh post the studio era in terms of of directors who could really get powerhouse performances out of out of every actor not just not just the the lead performances but always made sure that what he was doing what the film was doing was serving the performances so the performances could serve the film and everything was cohesive so again if you look at the performances he was able to get out of people and how effective those are uh, there, there's a reason why Sidney Poitier and Rod Steiger are so iconic in, in The Heat of the Night, or why Steve McQueen and Faye Dunaway are so iconic in The Thomas Crown Affair, or why Michael Caine is so staggeringly uh, amazing in The Statement. So it, it, it all requires somebody behind the camera who is able to bring all those elements together and make everything worked together to serve the the whole purpose of of the film which is of course telling a story that means something and that's what norman jewison always did and I, I i just wanted to put something together in terms of trying to better promote his his incredible body of work which i still think is criminally underrated so again uh, if you've only seen a few of his films or if you haven't seen any please do yourself a favor and go and look at uh, some or all of his filmography if you're new to his films i would certainly suggest starting with in the heat of the night the russians are coming the russians are coming the thomas crown affair rollerball moonstruck there's so many uh, or of course uh, a soldier story or and i would also include the statement his last film which i think is a a very underrated film and a great film to study in terms of looking at a director's final work and certainly get a copy of his incredible memoir which is uh, one of the best film books I've ever read. So as always I hope my babbles about films and directors and and filmographies and and people I really respect and admire in the film industry has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, again I strongly encourage everyone to go and look at Norman Jewison's incredible body of work. I think it's a fantastic testament to also the man himself. Uh, and as always, please do keep supporting both uh, studios and boutique labels and also publishers by buying physical media and also uh, film books to help keep both physical media and film books and film culture itself alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.